Last Sunday night, or last Sunday morning, uh, we handed out this new resource, 21 Days of <coughs> Prayer and Fasting, entitled Without Ceasing. And uh, I noticed that several of them were gone, so I'm assuming that they either got thrown away or taken home with you. Uh, I hope that you took some home with you, or at least took one home with you, and then you're working through it. It's a great devotional to work through as a couple, uh, or uh, simply by yourself. It's not real long. It won't take you real long to do it. But I just encourage you to, uh, to continue that, um, whatever you're fasting, um, as was admonished in the introduction here, I hope that you spend that time that you would be doing the other thing in prayer. Uh, as it said last week, uh, if you're, uh, how do you put it, refraining from, from food without prayer to seeking God is not fasting, it's called dieting. Um, and uh, that can easily become what we do, uh, but I encourage you to fast and seek God's face while you're doing it, and uh, if you're able to do that, I know that God will, will answer, okay? If you have, if, if you need any more of these, I think there's a few more left somewhere around here, but if you didn't get one, just uh, let me know after the service, I'd be happy to give you another copy, okay? All right, uh, let's stand together in reading of God's Word. I'm going to read three verses of Scripture to you. This morning, I'll endeavor not to preach real long. Um, I do want to share God's word with you and deliver to you the message that I feel He's placed on my heart for today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you'll see that uh, if you have a modern translation, especially that is divided into sections, you'll see that this is Paul's final advice, verses 12 through verse 22. I'll give some final advice to the church in Thessalonica. And uh, in verse 16, 17, and 18, he gives some very definitive commands. Um, some things that he tells the church, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you must do. And uh, I'm going to read verses 16, 17, and 18. And uh, then we'll have a little prayer. And we'll get into this a little bit deeper together. That's or, I'm sorry, I'll read it. Always be joyful, verse 16. Never stop praying, verse 18. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word that is open before us, not just open physically with Bibles and with cell phones or tablets this morning, but word that is an open door into our lives to help us to become more like Christ. So Lord, I pray that as we look into this passage, this brief passage, this brief uh, commands from you, that uh, Lord, you would, because your word is open, that it would open our hearts and that we would respond and we would walk uh, as Christ would have us to walk in accordance to your word. Strengthen us, help us, and may we be better Christians because of uh, what you show us today in Christ's name. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. <laughs> Verses number 16 through 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, is an open appeal or a command from God for continual action in our lives. We Christians often are not good at the continual. We are often good at the momentary or uh, the, the points in life. We look back to those points. How many of you remember the moment you were saved? Where you were? What you were doing? How many of you remember times in your life where God drove a stake in your life and you look back to that point kind of as an anchor point in your life and you know that uh, this is my Ebenezer. Hitherto the Lord has helped me here. Uh, we look back at times like that. This command that we find in God's word is a command that is continual. It's a command that keeps going. It's an appeal for us to never stop doing some of these things. The Christian is called to do three things. And Paul uses these words that are translated in this particular translation, the New Living Translation. These words that he use, uses in these three verses are always, never, and in all things. Now, I've been to a marriage counseling seminar and uh, some of those are words that they say you ought never use in an argument with your spouse. 
You always leave your socks on the floor, right? I do. Yeah. <laughs> you never have supper on time. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> Mark, you've used up all your speaking ability for this service. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, but what happens when we use words like that? Often we get responses uh, that are eternal in themselves, right? Uh, and uh, usually it doesn't turn out very well. In all things, uh, you can't do anything how it's supposed to be done, right? You can't cook anything like mom can cook. Oh dear. It's fighting words. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. The reality is, these are words that encompass a lot of power. Always, in all things, never. And these words that are words that we must use carefully. Today, we're not, we don't have enough time to focus on all three of these verses uh, in their global context, but uh, we're going to focus on the command which is sandwiched between the two, okay? Uh, I think it's the meat of what he says. How many of you like sandwiches? Uh, what's in between the bread is the most important part, right? Uh, right. Uh, so we're going to talk this morning about Paul's command in verse 17 to never stop praying. Never stop praying. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, maybe you've heard of him. He's the American essayist. He brings some clarification to this business of never stopping our prayers or praying without ceasing. Emerson made the following observation. It is not only when we audibly and in form address our, per our petitions to the deity or to God that we pray. He says we pray without ceasing. Every secret wish is a prayer. Every house is a church. And the corner of every street becomes a closet of devotion for the Christian. Amen? We pray here. We pray there. We pray at work. We pray in our car. We pray at home. We pray in the grocery store. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Praying without ceasing. It's not just a focused time of prayer when Jesus says in Matthew that we are to go into a closet and pray. But here Paul says, I want you to pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Why? Uh, I hope that we can answer that together uh, over the next few minutes. A.W. Tozer said this quote, and it fascinates me and humbles me often whenever I hear it or read it. He said, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. We are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. God wants us to be preoccupied with Him. You ever talk to someone who's daydreaming? Some of you are looking at your, your spouse right now in the corner of your eye. Yeah, I do that a lot. Uh, you ever try to speak to someone? I find it I, sometimes when my kids are trying to speak to me and I'm trying to return a text or an email or, or something that they have no clue that I, is important and uh, that I, I'm going to get to you in just a second, but they're saying, Dad, 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 Dad. You know what I'm talking about. They, they do that. Um, in their mind, I'm just preoccupied. Right? Yes, they know that I love them. Yes, they know that they're important, but in their mind, dad's mind is somewhere else at times, and I'm guilty of that, and I try to work on that from time to time because I know it's important that they know that they're important, but that's what God wants our minds to be like in him. How often throughout the day do you think about Jesus? Do you talk with him? One of my favorite old, I don't know if it's a gospel song or a hymn, I'm not sure which it would be entitled, but it's the one that says in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew drops are still in the roses. You've heard it before. But it gets to the part where it says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. I like to flip that around in my mind. And it says, and I walk with him, and I talk with him. Amen? Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Why? Because God took him. Why did God took him? Because Enoch walked with God. God is calling us brothers and sisters, to a relationship with him. Not a momentary, not a stagnant place in time and in history that we look back and say we met God, but God wants a present, walking, living, growing, vital relationship that goes not just Sunday by Sunday or midweek by midweek, but moment by moment. Do you know him like that? Do you talk with him? Pray without ceasing. 
The Bible tells us to do a lot of things always. In Psalm 34 and verse 1, we are told always to praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. The King James says his words shall his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Do you do that? We are called to keep our minds always focused upon God. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. Maybe you've heard these verses. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed upon you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. You see it? Always. But you don't understand, Pastor. I work an eight-hour day job, or I work a 10-hour day, or a 12-hour day, or a 14-hour day job. I don't have time to do this, but the Bible says always. And I believe that's not something that should drive us into the ground and say, man, am I praying about am, am I doing all Am I doing these things that he says always? But what it should do is remind us that if he didn't have the ability to give us these things, that he would have never commanded us to do it always. Our God can do that, right? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Why can we say that? Because he can focus our mind and our heart upon him at all times. So we always have strength. We always have reserve in him. We are called... And in our verse that we looked at here, our text today in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, or 5, 17, never stop praying. In other words, God has set the precedence in the true believer's life that prayer is an immovable and irrevocable part of the Christian life. You show me a Christian who does not pray, and I will show you a Christian who is not strong in their faith, and very likely will fall away. Always. Pray. Never stop praying. I've heard people argue before, well, I have my prayers, uh, but God, God calls me to do it. And honestly, I, I lean into that camp a little bit, naturally. Uh, I'm in favor of praying. I'm in favor of seeking God's face. But at the same time, I'm ready to do something. Anybody else like that? Am I just weird? Uh, we, we do that sometimes, right? But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with either one of those things, okay? Okay. But I love what Martin Luther said. He said, pray as if everything depends on God, then work as if everything depends on you. That's a good balance, isn't it? It's good wings for the airplane of our Christian life. Never stop praying. Everything does depend upon God. But God calls us to not just wait, but he calls us to obey. Right? There are many things in our lives that at first glance uh, we would say are absolutely necessary. Someone name just a couple of things that are absolutely necessary. You cannot go without. Anybody like that? It's an interactive sermon today. Water. Yeah. water. Yep. Go without water, you're dead. Air. Air, oxygen. Good. Anybody else? Food. Sleep. Okay. I've I've not heard any millennial request or any millennial feedback yet. <laughs> Everybody pull your cell phone out. You got it close to you? Hold it up. Let me see how many cell phones we have here. Isn't that amazing? We can shut the lights off and do like they do in the concert. You know, make everybody glow. It's great. We did that at a dance show once. The yeah. went out on stage and everybody held up their Shine phone. your light. And there was enough light that they could see. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Because in America, look at where we've come. That's a whole new twist on this little light of mine. Right? <laughs> things are necessary we even think cell phones are necessary anybody ever feel naked when you don't have your cell phone not, at all. not literally but you, know what I mean. you just feel like you had to work and you realize I'm going to be 8 hours without this thing I don't know what to do some of you are like thank God I hit it I didn't want to take it to uh, without your cell phone you feel bored that's a a common word among young people and children these days. I'm bored. They've got to have something in their hand. I see them at the doctor's office. I see them at Walmart. They're walking around running into things. Boom. Oh, I've got my tablet here. I'm playing Candy Crush or whatever they play. Uh, without our cell phones, we're bored. Without our cell phones, we don't know how to get anywhere. Am I right about that? Anybody got a Rand McNally Atlas in your car now? No. Oh, it's gone. Yeah, she, she has one because she doesn't trust your directions. You have one. There you go. And Gail reads it, right? But you can't throw them away because they cost a lot of money. That's right. <laughs> just keep them. Now we just download them and scroll. We feel isolated 
without her cell phone. You go 72 hours without a cell phone, without a phone call, text message, social media. Tell me how you feel. You feel isolated, don't you? You feel isolated. Sometimes we even feel unimportant without our cell phone. Right? I remember when I was in college, cell phones, young people believe this or don't believe it. Uh, cell phones were fairly new when I, when I was in high school. They were fairly, my, my dad had one of those bag phones that you could like use as an anchor on a, on a ship. Uh, you had one of those, had the long cord and everything. Uh, but, but I'll never forget when the, when the new cell phones were coming out and they actually had words and they had the pagers that would scroll the scores of the NFL games. And the, and the, you know what I'm talking about? Remember those pagers? Man, I felt important. I'm like, Mom, just let me carry it. I don't even know how to use it. Just let me put it on my side because people think I'm important. Right? It's necessary in our lives. It's necessary. What if prayer became just as necessary to us as our cell phone? What if we constantly checked in with God as much as we check in with Facebook? What if we constantly cared about his opinion as much as we care about somebody's Twitter or a tweet? What if we cared about him and our life was so connected to his that we weren't lost when we didn't have our cell phone because he could speak into our life and he could give us direction. Important things, necessary things. Paul says, never stop praying. Why? It's because we're lost without that connection to God. We're lost. Proverbs 3, 4, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Right? So in other words, if we are not allowing him to direct my path, and I'm not allowing him to direct my path, and I'm leaning on my own understanding, therefore the conclusion is I will not get where I'm supposed to go if I'm not listening to his voice. And I can't listen to his voice without spending time with him consistently and constantly. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Anybody ever read that? Or watch the movie? Watch the movie, it's a lot shorter. Uh, <laughs> Pilgrim's Progress, a powerful book written by John Bunyan hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Listen to these three quotes that I found about prayer from John Bunyan. He says, and, and he was in the days of Old English, so it's still printed in that way. He says, when thou prayest, rather let thy heart be without words than thy words be without heart. Praying without ceasing. Let my heart be without words. Some of my most precious prayer times, and those of you who spend time with the Lord, you know exactly what I'm talking about, are the times when I'm not saying anything. And I don't even know that God's necessarily saying anything. But you just come into his presence and just, you're his, you're there. You're there. I remember Brother Wingrove Taylor, who just passed away. Maybe some of you have heard of him. Uh, I heard him, had him in revival in Zanesville when I was there and. uh i never forget spending just really not even more than a few hours going back and forth to the airport and, and just time that we were just alone together. Uh, but I'll never forget, I was talking to him and asking him about his spiritual life. He was just a deep man of prayer, a deep man of, of the Word of God, an incredible uh, believer and uh, a mentor to so many. And, and I just asked him, I said, Brother Taylor, how, how, what would you say is, is the most, most useful or powerful tool that God showed you to, to have the depth in your spiritual life like you have? In his Bahamian or, or island, I'm not sure which island he was from in the Caribbean, but in his accent, he said, Pasta. He said, I just live to be his. At first, I was taken back. I was, what do you mean, live to be his? I mean, I, I'm wanting the silver bullet. You know, I'm a young pastor. I, I need to get into this A.W. Tozer mode every once in a while like you have. You can tell me the secret. He said, the secret is just living to be his. Living moment by moment in his presence. That's the secret. That's the secret. You show me someone who has a deep relationship with God, and I'll show you someone who prays without ceasing. They're always communicating with him. How else can we walk in the spirit? We can't do it. We continually speak to God. Now, that doesn't mean we, doesn't, we don't talk to anybody else. We don't do anything else. It simply means that we are preoccupied, even while we're doing mundane tasks. We are communicating with our Father. What a blessing. What a blessing. John Bunyan also said, you can do more than pray, 
after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. You can do more than you, more, more, to, more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. I like this one the best. He says, John Bunyan says, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. What's keeping you from praying without stopping? What's keeping you from speaking his name? Is it because sin has entered your life? Is it because distractions have pulled you away? Is it become because you you may have at times um, become more aware of your abilities than God's abilities? Prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Let's get back to our text. Just briefly, uh, three thoughts I want to leave with you today. First of all, praying without ceasing means... If I really believe it, and I really do it, it means that I believe God is trustworthy. If I pray without ceasing, it really shows myself and everybody around me that I believe that God is trustworthy, that I can depend upon God. Prayerlessness, Daniel Henderson has said, and I think I've shared this quote before, prayerlessness is my declaration of independence from God. When I don't pray, I tell God I don't need Him. I tell God I've got it. I tell God that uh, I'll see you Sunday. Just leave me alone. Prayerlessness is my declaration of independence from God. Romans chapter 8, verses 27 and 28. Paul gives us this passage, these few verses here that are very common, but I think there's depth there. He says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes for them. Let me ask a question. Do you believe that? The reason we should pray is because God's working everything for our good. The reason I should constantly call upon God and I should constantly be, be communicating with Him as much as I possibly can throughout my day is because if He's working things out for my good, I need to hear what He's telling me to do. And I need to do what I hear Him telling me to do. Praying without ceasing means I believe God is trustworthy. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Do you think more about your problems or do you pray more about your problems? Ouch. I've got to say ouch there because I'm tempted to do the very same thing. And oftentimes I fail in this matter. Someone has said if you have time to worry about your problems, you have time to pray about your problems. Ouch again, right? Sometimes we, we talk about our problems, we worry about our problems, we stew in our problems. And, and I know people who, who are on tranquilizers, if you will. Uh, I remember... Uh, uh, Otto Koning was saying that he was on tranquilizers over in New Guinea as a missionary because of all the people stealing his stuff and all this problem that was going on. And he just realized that when he gave God his stuff, uh, that he could rest good. He could rest well. Prayer, praying without ceasing means I believe that God is trustworthy. When I pray, I tell God, you are the one who is able, not me. You see, it's submission to him. It's submission to him. How many of you parents love it when your children ask you something kindly and not 672 times in a row? Uh, but they ask you for something and you're able to fulfill that need. What a blessing. What a blessing. Our God is trustworthy. We ask him. We communicate with him. We respond to him. We obey him. And we know that he's working everything. And I mean everything. There's another one of those words, right? Always all the time, never stop, everything. God is working everything for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Or in other words, are committed to his purposes. Number two, praying without ceasing means not only that I believe God is trustworthy, but it means I always have something to do. Okay? Um, you know what? Uh, it's becoming more and more of a common thing that I hear people say. I hear people say things like this, I've just got to get away and find myself. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if they ever find themselves. Right? They, they typically find a beach and a book or something. Maybe someone prop their feet up and relax a little bit. I understand the need for a relaxation, but the reality is we don't need to find ourselves. We need to find God. Okay? We need to find God. I always have something to do. Paul tells us that we are to never stop praying. That means there should never be a time in my life 
when I am not ready to or able to talk to my Heavenly Father. Even if I can't speak a word. Right? Even if I can't move a muscle. The other day we were driving down the road and, and uh, Roman was with me. And, and Actually, it was just yesterday. We were driving down the road. Roman was with me. And, and Johnny Erickson Tata came on into the radio. And you know who she is. She was a young lady who was paralyzed in a diving accident. She's a quadriplegic, I believe. And uh, can't move really anything from her, her head down, her neck down. And uh, Roman said, isn't that lady crippled? And uh, I said, yeah. And you know Johnny, since Johnny Erickson taught her, her, her uh, voice is so cheerful. And, and she just lifts the spirits of everyone around her when she speaks. And, and Roman said, wow, you mean she can't move or whatever? I said, yeah. I said, she's a Christian? I said, yeah. And we were to talk about the joy of the Lord in the midst of horrible circumstances and horrible uh, limit, limitations and disabilities. And how that she still has the joy of the Lord about that. Praying without ceasing is something that causes that to be able to happen. We always have something to do. If you're lying flat on your back and can't communicate with anybody around you, you can whisper in your heart to your Heavenly Father and you can pray without ceasing. You can pray without ceasing. We always have something to do. We always have something to do. In other words, Paul's saying, don't stop doing this for anything. Uh, wintry weather is an interesting thing, especially the first couple of snows of the year. Drive in an area and you see uh, cars in the ditch. That probably happened Friday and overnight when it ended Saturday. There's a lot of people in the ditch. Uh, a lot of things that a lot of people don't understand that when you're going up a hill in ice and snow, it's really not how hard you push the accelerator down. Uh, in fact, that's a bad thing. It's about the momentum, right, that gets you up the hill. How fast can I get going going up the hill? And that will determine whether or not I make it up, make it up the hill. It doesn't matter how hard I push the accelerator down. What Paul is telling us to do is that when we pray without ceasing, we are allowing God to have constant acceleration, not constant acceleration, but to have constant momentum in our life. You know what we do? We coast, and then when we come to the hill, we all, all of a sudden, we're in crisis mode, and we have to call upon God, and we have to jam down on the gas pedal, but there's no momentum in our life, because we have to pray without ceasing. Uh, Corey Ten Boom put it this way. She said, uh, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? We only want to break it out when we need it. But what if we prayed without ceasing? What if we said, God, I'm going to talk to you even when I don't need anything from you? What if we said, God, I'm going to, I'm going to communicate with you uh, even if I don't know that there's anything bad happening in my life at the moment for once? I'll tell you what will happen. Momentum will build in your life. And when you come to those hills... Praying without ceasing will take you right over that because you're already connected to God. You don't have to try to make up uh, time with God. Anybody ever try to do that, make up time with God? You know what I mean? You, you've not been very diligent in your, your seeking of the Lord, and, and maybe your church attendance has been bad, or maybe you just missed devotions four or five days in a row, and all of a sudden crisis comes into your life, and you're saying to yourself, oh, I really got, man, I don't want to talk to God because I've, I've, I've kind of ignored him, I've neglected him. The answer to that up and down, roller coaster spiritual life is this, pray without ceasing. Spend time with him consistently. When the time comes for the trials, when the time comes for the hills and the mountains, you will see his hand work, and you will have enough to go through them because you're already connected to the source. Amen? Jesus said to John, without me, you can do nothing. So don't even try. Seek his face. I always have something to do. Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, don't be anxious or worried about anything. But in everything, in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request known to God. And the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ is yours. Why? Because I'm praying without ceasing. I'm connected to God. Don't be anxious or worried about anything, but pray about everything. How in the world am I supposed to pray about everything? You just keep praying. You just keep praying. Every opportunity that we see around us should give us an opportunity to pray. You believe that? No matter what you're doing, you should give us an opportunity to pray. Every, even the smallest thing as we're driving down the road, we can say, God, I thank you for that sunrise on my way to work. That's praying, by the way. You don't have to be asking God for things in order to be praying. 
It's praising Him. In fact, that's a bigger part of, the, of prayer is giving God praise. When someone at work or, or at, the, at the grocery store does something that you don't like, pray for that person. Jesus said pray for your enemies, didn't He? Uh, pray for that person. Pray for someone who, who, who's doing something like that. Why? Because that connects me to God and that keeps my attention focused upon Him. Right? Keeps my mind stayed on Him. Paul says something like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What is he talking about? He's saying, don't just float around with your mind, but let your mind be focused on Christ. Focused on His will for your life. Praying without ceasing means I always have something to do. There is never a time when a Christian should say, I'm just bored spiritually. I'm just bored spiritually. Why? Because we are commanded to always pray. Never stop <coughs> praying. Number three, and finally this morning. Praying without ceasing means I never give up on God's ability to act. Why should we keep praying? Because we have a Father who is able to do anything that needs to be done. You believe that? Maybe you didn't catch that. I said, we never give up on God's ability to act because we have a Father who can do anything. Christian, don't stop praying. You don't see the answer. It doesn't seem like it's changing. It seems like it's getting worse. Don't stop praying because we have a Father who can act and who can change anything. Praise His name. Adam Clark said it this way, While you live to God, prosperity and adversity will equally be helpful to you. What did he mean by that? He means when things are good or when things are bad, Everything that God allows into our life ought to remind us that God is the one who gives the blessings and God is the one who can bring the answer. Praise His name. What does it mean when I stop praying? When I stop praying, I'm saying to God, you can't even help me. When I stop praying, I'm saying God doesn't know what He's talking about. When I give up, I stop praying, God doesn't know what He's talking about. When I stop praying, I'm saying that I'm stronger than God and I've got this. When I stop praying, I essentially announce Satan as the victor in my life. I don't pray about it anymore. When I stop praying, I'm saying that what Christ did on the cross has no effect. And it wasn't enough. And it will never be enough. When I stop praying. Christian? Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Don't ever stop praying. Why? Because our God is able. Our God is able. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, Paul says this. When I think of all this, and if you want to know what all this is, just read the first three chapters of Ephesians up to this point. Paul's talking about the, the power of God that works in people. And the last three chapters, Paul's telling us how to work that out and live that out. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. You see, it matters who you're talking to. Right? If Jesus is your lucky rabbit's foot in your pocket that you pull out when you need something, uh, then, then this really isn't going to work for you. But Paul says, I fall on my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand all, as all God's people should, how wide and long and high and deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then Paul wraps up with one of the most beautiful benedictions of his prayer. I believe it has ever been written. Now, all glory to God who is able. Our God is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and forever. Amen. Yeah. Do you see what Paul was saying? He's saying we have power that God works within us. He is able. There is never going to be a time in or out of your life that God is not able to do something miraculous for you. 
There is never a time in or out of this, this universe that we live in that God is not going to be the awesome, infinite, sovereign being that is over it all. God is able through the power that he works in us through his son, Jesus Christ. And I love how Paul added the, he paid the extra for the stamp on this letter. Did you see that? Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Just the other day, I was in my office. I had to mail something out, and uh, I, uh, I put a stamp on there. And I had stamps, a little half a roll of stamps that stuck way back in my desk from probably, I don't know, eight years ago, ten years ago. And uh, I, I don't even remember what stamps, uh, how much they're supposed to be now. I usually buy the forever ones. You know what I'm talking about? Those are easy. Because if you're forgetful like me, you never know when you've got to get the extra two, th two cent or five cent, whatever they are. So I put the stamp on, and I'm like, that doesn't look right. That looks awful cheap. I think times have changed. And so I stuck another stamp on there. And I thought to myself, that ought to get it where it's going. It might be overkill, but it's going to get there. They're not going to send it back or not take it because they didn't pay enough money. What Paul's doing right here is putting an extra stamp on it. He'll do it for you. And he'll do it for you. And he'll do it for your kids. And he'll do it for your grandkids. He'll do it for the stranger down the street that don't know anything about Jesus and their grandkids. And for generations to come forever and forever, our God is able. Praise his holy name. Missionary Walter Bright, and I'll close with this. Missionary Walter Bright says uh, in a blog that he wrote, I thought it was powerful, there are 11 things that our God is able to do according to his word. There's even more, but these are the 11 that he picked. First of all, God is able to create something out of nothing. Our God can create something out of nothing. God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham, Jesus said in Matthew 3. In other words, you think you have the limitations on what's able to be happening here. He says, but God can raise up stones to be children of Abraham. God can do something. He can create something out of nothing. Number two, God is able to make all grace to abound to you. What does that mean? That means that grace that I don't even know that I need to ask for, God can make abound in my life. Not just get it in there, but he can make it abound in my life. God is able to make all grace abound to you, having all sufficiency in all things at all times. You may abound in every good work, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God can make grace abound in your life. You say, well, there's not much room for abounding in grace in my life. I'm kind of, kind of stale, I'm kind of, kind of dead. Let me tell you something, God can set your life on fire with the Holy Spirit, and you will never even recognize who you are or what you used to be anymore. God's able to make grace abound. God is able to deliver. How many of you know that's to be true? God is able to deliver. God is able to deliver. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. God whom, we, God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. What if we spoke to the habits in our life and told them that? My God can deliver me. What if we spoke hope into our life and said, my God can deliver me? My God can pick me up out of this and not even think twice about it. Why? Because he's able. He's able. God is able to give you strength to rise above trials. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Our prayers are often, God, take it away. Right? God, take it away. I don't want this. Take it away. But you know what God's designed for us in our life with our trials is? I won't take it away, but I'll take you through it. I'll take you through it. And when you get on the other side, you'll never be the same again. God is able to give you strength to rise above your trials. Christian, don't give up. Don't ask for him to take it away because you'll never get better. Ask for him to take you through it. God is able to save Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save to the, utter, to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What can God do? He can save to the uttermost. One person said it this way, God can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. How saved is that? I don't know. Maybe it's like Michael Jr. says, that comedian, it's oversaved. I don't know how saved you can get, but I know one thing, God can change your life. Why? Because he's able. He's able. Like, are you seeing it here? Are you seeing it? Is the God that you talk to the God that's able to do these things? Because that's the God of the Bible. And if your God can't do that, you might want to trade him in and find the real God. 
get rid of the imposter in your life that tells you you can't do anything and God can't do anything and I'm sorry it's too big and I just can't, I'm, there's nothing you can do. Trade that God in and find the God who can do it, the God who's able. God is able to build you up in grace. Praise God for that. Acts chapter 20, verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God is able to build us up in his grace. David says in the Old Testament when his child died, the Bible, rather the Bible says about David, it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now you think that was all David? You think David just said, all right, I'm going to be encouraged now. <laughs> Wish we could do that, don't you? Anybody else like that? You know, you just wish we could just like push that courage button or encouragement button. Boom, I'm encouraged. We can't do it all the time. You know what? There's a lot of people that go around and there is nothing they can do to change how they feel and how they think. But you know what? We have a God who can. Right? I think half of us would be in an insane asylum, insane asylum right now if it wasn't for the grace of God. Right? We'd be lost. But the grace of God is able to make grace abound and build us up in our lives. God can build me up. And when God builds you up, he has better bricks and mortar than anybody else. Right? The winds of Satan can't tear it down. That's why there can be joy in the midst of issue and problem and tragedy and all these things. God is able to build us up in his grace. God is able to exceed your expectations. He is able to do exceedingly above all you can ask. Do you believe that? Anybody ever ask God for something crazy? God, God, I, I want to ask God for things that if he doesn't do it, it can't be done. Right? And, and I want it to obviously be according to his will and to build his kingdom. That's, that's the purpose of anything we ask. It's got to be for his glory first and foremost. But are you asking God to do things that only he can do? 2 Chronicles chapter 25 the word of God says, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Much more than this. Really? This is all you're going to ask for? It's like being a millionaire and your kid keeps coming and you asking you for a dollar. A dollar? Here's a thousand. Right? Much more than this. God is able to exceed your expectation. Maybe the reason God's not answering our prayers as much as we would like for him to do is because we're praying too small. Praying too small. Maybe God wants to do bigger things, exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even think to ask. God is able to keep you from falling. Jude 124. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. What can God do? He can keep you from falling. God can keep you until the day you leave this world. That's good news. That's good news. God can keep you. He is able to keep you from stumbling, keep you from falling, and to present you blameless. What a blessing from God's word this morning. God can present you before the holy presence of the Trinity, the triune God, blameless. Because of his grace that works in your life and in mine. God is able to guard the good word in you and good deposit in you and to keep you from error, he says. I'm convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within. Paul tells Timothy these words. God is able to make the check clear that he's promised you and that he's written out to you in your life. You believe that? We used to sing a song. Uh, I'm trying to think of the tune of it right now. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day based on this very passage. That's what God can do. I'm persuaded. There's nothing that can keep God from coming true in his promises in our lives. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells within, he says. Almost done. God is able to fulfill his promises. He's able to fulfill his promises. You read the word of God. You meditate on the word of God. You hear what he promises you. You spend time connected with him in prayer. And you realize that I'm going to keep praying because my God is able to keep his word. He's able to keep his promises. When he says he's going to do it, he does it. When he says he, 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 he won't leave me uh, without, without comfort, that he'll send me the spirit, he'll do that. Why? Because God keeps his word. God is able to fulfill his promises. Romans 4.21 
Paul says, I'm fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. God's able. And if God's able, what will he do? He'll do it. Right? Someday your kids might ask you for something that you're not able to provide for them. Right? You know, your kids are, Dad, I got accepted in the medical school. My response, good luck. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm not able to send a kid through medical school, are you? Uh, I, I don't have hundred or $200,000 laying around. I'm not able to do that. But you know what? Our father will never have to say that to us. He never says good luck. He never says, well, do your best. I'll try to chip in where I can. You know? But our guide says, I can do that. I can do that. Our God is able to fulfill his promises. Lastly, this morning, our God is able to comfort those who are afflicted. Our God's able to bring comfort, isn't he? He brings comfort. He brings peace. He brings strength. He brings joy. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you see it? God can comfort you and he can speak into your life in such a way that you're able to be his, a tool in his hand to comfort somebody else in their affliction. That's what we need, isn't it? Overflowing comfort of God. Overflowing comfort of God. I've gone to, I can't tell you how many funerals, I can't tell you how many people that I've committed back into the earth uh, as their pastor or as a pastor that was officiating their funeral. Um, and it always saddens me at funerals when I see people who are hurting trying to comfort people who are hurting especially when they don't know Jesus. Because I know that no matter what they say, no matter what they do, they can't bring any hope. They can't really bring any comfort. I've sat with people and uh, searching for words that might bring comfort to their heart, knowing that, you know, I've never lost a parent, so there's really nothing I can say beyond, uh, obviously the word of God is powerful, but there's nothing personally that I can do to change how they feel, even though I, could, I would if I could. Our God is able to comfort those who are afflicted. Right? Pray without ceasing. Why? Because God uses that as an avenue to pour his grace into your life. Right? Pour his grace into your life. What if, what if we could be like those airplanes that could refuel in the, in the air? It's one of the coolest things. How many of you like airplanes? You ever see those big tankers that fuel, they stick that thing out? thousands and thousands of feet above the earth and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour they're flying along and that airplane never has to land on the ground to refuel what if God wants to do that in our life so you know what you don't got to fly in and land on Sunday get filled up fly back out maybe make it to a small group during the week get filled up fly back out but what if God says I want you to fly in such a way that I want to continually fill your life where you're not always the one needing to fill up, but you have something extra to give to somebody else in the midst of their affliction. What if God helped us to see how able he is to comfort us in the midst of our afflictions, in the midst of our hurts, in the midst of our pain? I believe that praying without ceasing teaches us to know how able our God is. When our minds stay on him, he'll keep us in perfect peace. We can fly in peace of who he is and because of what he can do. And so, I want to encourage you to seek the Lord, not just today, not just this week, but every day for the rest of your life. Seek his face. Pray without ceasing. Don't make your relationship with Jesus a, a, a truck stop relationship. Make it a constant communication with your Father. He loves you, and he is able. He is able. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that speaks comfort into our lives. Thank you for this command that is for our good. Lord, praying without ceasing seems like a big job. It seems like something that's impossible and something that draws us away from our everyday life. But I believe, Lord, that your word is very clear that it doesn't draw us away from our everyday life, but it enriches and magnifies your grace in our everyday life. And so, Lord, I pray that you would Use these words today to encourage us, that if 
there's a Christian here that maybe has found themselves not on uh, very confident speaking terms with you, that they would be reminded of your words in the book of Hebrews that says that through Christ, our high priest, we can come boldly to your throne of grace. Anytime. Moment by moment. Second by second. You have what we need. Lord, help us to fix our eyes upon you. We're reminded of the songwriter's words. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth, not just the possessions, but the stuff that we deal with here, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you for your word today. Open our hearts. Give us willingness and obedience to walk in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, All right, uh, for ushers will come, we'll receive our morning offering. We want to continue our worship. <laughs> offering is not.